Science Lecture for 2007. My name is Megan Rokoff, and I'm the Program Director of the Broad Institute Educational Outreach Program. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Vamsi Mutha. Vamsi is an associate member of the Broad Institute, and he's also a co-coordinator of the Broad's Metabolic Disease Initiative. Vamsi's work focuses on an organelle called the mitochondria, which he'll tell you about tonight, and also how the misfunctioning of the mitochondria can contribute to human disease. Vamsi received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He's currently an assistant professor of systems biology at Harvard Medical School and an assistant professor in medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vamsi Mook. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction and also for the invitation to come and speak here today. Um, those of you that know me know that I love talking about mitochondria, so I'll use any opportunity I can to sort of share my enthusiasm uh, for this structure of the cell uh, with, with, with all of you. Um, and during the course of the next 45 minutes, I have basically three primary goals. One is I want to provide an introduction to this organelle. It's a part of the cell that I've studied for the last 12 or 13 years. I think it's a remarkable uh, component of the cell, and hopefully uh, I can convince you that it's uh, something spectacular that you should be thinking about. Uh, and then the second component, after sort of a, a primer to mitochondria, I'm going to uh, uh, share with you some recent insights that suggest that this organelle is actually really important for human diseases. And then the final section, I'm going to share with you what we're doing here in this building to try to better understand the organelle so that we can actually combat some of these diseases. <clears throat> so um, I think most of you have probably heard the term mitochondria before. Uh, these are the tiny little structures that we're going to be talking about today. So this is uh, a mammalian cell. It's a human cell. This is the nucleus. And those of you that have been to a few of the other sessions, you know that the nucleus is what contains the bulk of our DNA. Uh, but within the rest of the cell body, there are these tiny thread-like granules okay, that are called mitochondria. And in this particular light microscopic image, what's happened is the scientists have uh, put a fluorescent protein, a protein that glows, so that it goes to this particular compartment of the cell. And you can see where in the cell these mitochondria are located. And the term organelle just means uh, a substructure within a cell. So mitochondria are organelles within a cell in the same way that the nucleus is an organelle within the cell. So those uh, bright orange structures are the mitochondria. And if you look under uh, really, really high magnification, uh, this is what they look like. So that little structure right there, blown up 10,000-fold, uh, uh, looks something like this. And this is an electron micrograph of uh, a cell. So again, we're still looking inside of a cell, and this is one mitochondrion. It's got a beautiful structure. It's actually uh, a double membrane structure. And so there's a membrane there, there's a membrane there. There's internal components and then outer external components. And many of you might remember this organelle from your high school biochemistry textbooks. And this is probably how it was depicted at that time. There's that outer membrane that I just showed you in the EM. And then here's that inner membrane that I just showed you. And then this is what's called the matrix space, the intermembrane space, and then the cytosol. That's sort of the uh, bulk of the cell. And while this type of cartoon is fantastic, it simply doesn't do justice to how beautiful it can be in different uh, uh, tissues. So this is a different type of a cell. This is actually muscle from, uh, uh, this is actually an electron micrograph of muscle from uh, a fly. And this is the apparatus that's responsible for the contractile machinery within the uh, uh, muscle of, of the wing. And then these are mitochondria. So there's tons of these structures for some reason inside of uh, the muscle. And just to provide you with a different perspective, these, this is an electron micrograph of a different type of a cell. This is a kidney cell. And all of these beautiful images are from Faroz Gadiali's classic sort of EM textbook on uh, the cell. He has little uh, uh, chapters on every single organelle uh, 
And I love the uh, 50 pages or so that he's devoted to this organelle. And so there's a lot of these little sausage-shaped uh, structures inside of a kidney as well. OK, so that's what they look like. But what's actually happening inside of our mitochondria? And virtually all of our body cells have this organelle, except for maybe red blood cells. Virtually every single one of our body cells uh, has many, many of these structures. So what happens inside? So most of you probably remember sort of the phrase, the powerhouse of the cell. This is what we're all taught in our high school biochemistry textbooks as the function of mitochondria. And here's um, uh, a, a type of a powerhouse that's actually from my hometown of Beaumont, Texas. This is the ExxonMobil oil refinery. And while it is true that the mitochondrion is sort of a powerhouse, I think a better analogy is that it's actually uh, a chemical refinery because as I'm going to share with you, this organelle does a number of different things. It doesn't just produce energy equivalents. It also performs a lot of chemical reactions to convert the foods that we eat into other intermediates that are required for the cell. Um, and so this is the ultimate uh, uh, chemical factory. And it's responsible for making energy equivalents. Uh, and the energy equivalent in our cells is something called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Um, and in the same way that a chemical refinery will take raw or crude oil and then convert it into kerosene or jet fuel or petroleum, likewise, the mitochondrion is responsible for taking the raw fuels we eat, fats and proteins and carbohydrates, and converting it into the structure, which is called ATP. And there are multiple ways of making ATP inside of the cells. And when a particular cell doesn't have oxygen, when it's under what's called anaerobic conditions, cells are capable of producing about two ATP for every molecule of glucose that we ingest. Okay. But there's actually two paths. The path that involves the mitochondrion requires oxygen. And when oxygen is available and when you have functioning mitochondria, you can actually squeeze a lot more ATP out of each molecule of glucose. And so here's that structure, the mitochondrion, the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and packed inside of this inner membrane, which ends up being one of the most proteinaceous membranes in the entire cell, um, is an entire set of protein complexes called the electron transport chain. And what this electron transport chain is going to do is it's going to carry out the chemical reactions necessary to convert glucose into ATP. And it does so in an incredibly efficient manner. So the net result is that you're producing 36 of these ATP for every molecule of glucose that you ingest. Okay, so when oxygen is available, this reaction can take place. And when oxygen is not available, we have to make the ATP under anaerobic conditions and it's far less efficient. But there are trade-offs in biology. And as it turns out, this pathway is extremely rapid. So even though it's inefficient, the anaerobic pathway is really, really fast. So it's kinetically favorable. But the aerobic pathway, which is a bit slower, is thermodynamically favorable. And so this is a recurring theme in biology. There's always competition and cooperation uh, between different pathways. And this is one of the classic examples. Um, humans, we have a preference for using uh, oxygen. So the bulk of our ATP is produced uh, under aerobic conditions. And so we're heavily, heavily, heavily reliant on this pathway that's called oxidative phosphorylation. That's called oxidative because we're using oxygen. And it's called phosphorylation because what we're doing is we're adding this extra phosphate bond onto ADP to make something called ATP. So this is sort of the core function of the mitochondrion. It's what the organelle is best known for. Now, if you've ever visited Beaumont, Texas, what you know is that all of these chemical refineries that are in my hometown also cause a lot of pollution. I think Baytown, which is actually not too far from me, is like amongst the top five most polluted towns uh, in the country. Now, Making all of that ATP in such an efficient way is fantastic, but occasionally some of those oxygen molecules can uh, 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 be used in an inefficient manner, and they basically produce pollution. 
uh, and the cellular pollution is something called reactive oxygen species. So the mitochondrion is really important for making the ATP in a highly efficient manner, but it's also responsible for producing and for containing most of the reactive oxygen species within our body's cells. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this ends up being uh, one of the sources of uh, disease, uh, especially for some of the common uh, degenerative diseases. Okay, so what else happens inside of this organelle? Because um, I told you that it's not just a power plant, it's actually more like a chemical refinery. So it supports oxidative phosphorylation. It's also going to be uh, uh, important for the homeostasis of these pollutants, these reactive oxygen species. Um, it's also really important for metabolizing things besides glucose. So if you want to fully oxidize fat, that also happens here. A lot of the sex hormones, other hormones are synthesized in part within this compartment. Um, I think those of you that have been to some of the other summer lectures, you've heard quite a bit about DNA and RNA. Those, the precursors for DNA and RNA, uh, to some extent are synthesized within the mitochondrion. When we eat protein, we have to excrete the nitrogen, and we excrete it in the form of urea, and much of that takes place within the mitochondrion. Um, heme is a, a molecule that's found within our red blood cells that's responsible for carrying oxygen from our, say, lungs to our peripheral tissues, and heme is also synthesized within this compartment. So as you can see, there's lots and lots of important functions. Uh, there's a relatively new pathway. This pathway is called programmed cell death or apoptosis. It's been understood or known for about the last 10 to 15 years. And it appears that the mitochondrion is a bit of a gatekeeper, if you will, for this process called programmed cell death. And what programmed cell death is, um, our body continuously makes cells. Our bone marrow is continuously churning out red blood cells and leukocytes and monocytes. But those cells typically have a finite lifespan. So after about 120 days or so, one certain cell type needs to die. And the, the programmed elimination of cells is called apoptosis or programmed cell death. And when you're not properly eliminating cells in your body, that can give rise to an abnormal proliferation of cells. And so often apoptosis, dysfunction in apoptosis can lead to cancers. And programmed cell death many of the steps of this pathway are resident within the mitochondrion. So it sometimes can sense the, the energy or the amount of reactive oxygen species and then make these important life uh, death decisions. And uh, another sort of fun sort of activity that happens within the mitochondrion is heat, ge is, is heat generation. Um, and here's another picture, another image from Thoreau's Gaudiali's textbook. And what this is, is believe it or not, we're looking inside of a single cell right now. And uh, all you can see are a couple of lipid droplets, which are labeled L, and everything else are mitochondria. So this is a tissue that most humans don't have. I don't see any infants over here. Um, this is a tissue called brown fat, and humans don't have much of it except right after we're born. But rodents and squirrels and bears, they have a lot of brown fat. So what they do is during the year, they'll eat lots and lots of nuts and berries and food. They'll fatten up. And a lot of that fat goes into the brown fat. Now when these animals go and hibernate, they need to generate heat because they're actually not going to be moving around. And so in order to generate heat, what they do is they liberate the fatty acids that are within these lipid droplets in this brown fat and they burn it up inside of these mitochondria. So they're like tiny little furnaces. So you can imagine that Exxon Mobil factory in Beaumont, if, if you're really cold, instead of producing refined oil, you could just use it to generate a lot of heat. And to some extent, that's what happens inside of this very special tissue called brown fat. And in humans, we do have it for the first, I think, couple of weeks or so after we're born. But we have very little brown fat. Uh, in, there's some obesity researchers that are trying to develop strategies of converting regular white fat into brown fat. Because if you did that, then all of the lipid droplets, all of the fat inside of white fat would just get burned away. And we'll revisit this issue a little bit later on when we talk about diseases. OK. Um, so 
say for the last like 30, 40 years or so, it's been well appreciated that these organelles are really, or are really striking in appearance. But it's only over the last few years that we've, be we've begun to appreciate how, how dynamic they are with respect to uh, uh, sort of moving around. So if you actually look under a microscope at mitochondria, they're not stagnant. They're swimming around all over the place. I'm going to play this a couple of times so that you can appreciate this. But these are yeast cells, um, so baker's yeast. Uh, and uh, what these scientists have done is, again, they've labeled their mitochondria so that they glow. They put in a protein that basically glows and target it to the organelle. And what you're going to see here are two cells. And during the course of the video, they're going to divide into four cells. And you can just uh, see how much they're moving around. And I'd like for you to try to appreciate uh, this particular cell. As it's dividing, it's almost going to be doubling the amount of mitochondria and then pushing it into its daughter cell. So watch this. There's the new cell right there, just budding off. And so during that entire cell cycle, what has to happen is the cells have to double the number of mitochondria that they have total, but then they have to distribute it as well to their daughter's cells. And, uh, uh, and so they almost have a life of their own. They almost look like they're living creatures inside of our cells. And uh, another feature that's kind of special about mitochondria is uh, they actually have their own genome. Okay? So this is the cartoon of the cell. And this is the nucleus. This is the endoplasmic reticulum. And here are these cartoon mitochondria. And the nucleus is what contains the bulk of our genome. This is the genome that was you know, sequenced in draft form in 2001. Uh, it consists of about 3 billion letters total. And these 3 billion letters total encode about 20,000 proteins or so. right? But Inside of each of these little mitochondria is another tiny little genome. And this is often forgotten. Uh, but every single one of these contains about five to 10 copies of a tiny little genome that's circular. So the main genome, these are linear strands of DNA. But within our mitochondria is a, is a genome that's often abbreviated mtDNA. It is circular. It's tiny. It's only 16,000 letters in uh, length compared to 3 billion. And it encodes 13 proteins total. Um, and so if you, th those of you that have studied biology in the past, you'll know that the other types of organisms that have tiny little genomes like this are things like bacteria. So bacteria also have very compact genomes. They tend to be circular. They lack certain proteins called histones, which are found in higher organisms. Um, and so when you see images like this, where they're sort of swimming around inside of a cell, and you recognize that these little things moving around inside of our cells also have their own DNA, it almost seems as though uh, they're another life form. Okay? And I just want to show one. If we can just dim the lights, if that's possible, I'd love to show a video clip. And if um, if I could get technical help on that, and if not, I'll figure it out. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. So this is a really important video clip. So pay attention. Master, sir. I heard Yoda talking about midichlorians. I've been wondering, what are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Inside your cells, yes. And we are symbionts with them. Symbionts? Life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. 
When you learn to quiet your mind, you'll hear them speaking to you. I don't understand. The time and training, Emmy, you will. You will. So uh, I was a pretty nerdy junior high student, and Star Wars, like the first three episodes, were, were, were I was pretty fond of them. But it wasn't until this episode that I really, really became a big fan of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so what are they talking about? So they do refer to these midichlorians, mitochondria, as microscopic life forms. But they also refer to something else called symbionts or symbiosis. So what are they talking about? Okay, so. What we do believe today is that these mitochondria were once bacteria. So about two, two and a half billion years ago or so, what we think happened was that the oxygen levels inside uh, on our planet were rising. And as the oxygen levels were rising, uh, a very interesting collaboration emerged. So there was something called the proto-eukaryote. So this is probably a single cell organism that did not have anything resembling mitochondria. And it's probably an organism that made ATP without oxygen, right? It made it using that rapid pathway, the pathway that's inefficient. Okay? At the same time, there were certain bacteria that were capable of making ATP in an efficient manner, using oxygen when the oxygen was available. And what we think happened is that this bacterium invaded into this proto-eukaryote, formed a collaboration, and it became an irresistible collaboration for both of them uh, because um, uh, of the changing external environment. And so now there's an advantage for this proto-eukaryote to actually maintain this little uh, bacterium because it's actually going to produce ATP in a very efficient manner. Okay. And in fact, there are some modern day bacteria that we think probably resemble uh, this progenitor bacterium. And this entire process is called endosymbiosis. And at one point, it was called the endosymbiotic hypothesis for the origins of mitochondria. And I think at this point, it's, it's fair to say that this is a, a theory. So do we have any idea what this proto-eukaryote or this initial aerobic bacterium was? <clears throat> well, what's really nice is places like the Broad and other institutes around the world, they've been sequencing lots and lots and lots of genomes. So identifying sort of weird creatures that live in the sea or in the soil, sequencing genomes uh, of other animals. And we literally have hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, genome sequences that are fully available to us. So what we can do now is we can take our DNA as well as our mitochondrial DNA and ask, which of the living organisms that we see today on the planet Earth are most closely related uh, either to our nuclear genome or to this aerobic bacterium? Um, and from these types of studies, we actually have some sense as to what that proto-eukaryote and what that initial aerobic bacterium was. Uh, and we're pretty sure that the thing that invaded the proto-eukaryote resembles uh, uh, a modern day bacterium called Rickettsia prozaki. This is something called a gram negative rod. It's an intracellular pathogen, uh, and it's the causative agent of uh, typhus. And what's amazing is the bug that lives today, it likes to use oxygen. It can't live on its own. It actually has to invade our cells, and only then can it survive. There's a couple of other intracellular pathogens that live today, things like chlamydia, things like listeria. So there's a fair number of other bugs uh, that like to move inside and take advantage of everything that the host cell is providing. So we're pretty sure about this. Now, what was the original proto-eukaryote? For, for the longest time, for the last, I would say, 10, 15 years or so, uh, prior to 2003, everyone thought that the modern day relative of the proto-eukaryote was something called microsporidia. So examples of microsporidia are uh, things like giardia, which cause uh, uh, a really, really bad diarrhea if you've gone camping before. Um, and the reason everyone thought that microsporidia were closely related to this is because everyone thought that microsporidia don't have mitochondria. So they're pretty complex looking cells. They're single cell organisms, and they have a lot of other features that pretty complex eukaryotic cells have, except they lack mitochondria. So until 2003, everyone said Rickettsia proazaki invaded something like a giardia, 
two and a half billion years ago to give rise to modern day uh, uh, sort of uh, cells containing mitochondria. And that was until the year 2003 when there was a really spectacular paper. And in this paper what they did is they actually took uh, not the types of microsporidia that you get in the laboratory, but they took relatives of microsporidia from their natural habitats. And when you take those particular cells and you look at them under electron microscopy using the same technologies that are used to produce some of the other images that I've shown you, they actually do have double membrane structures. Uh, they have tiny primitive mitochondria and what was happening was when you take these organisms from their natural habitats and grow them in the cell culture conditions, they somehow eliminate the structure so they were undetectable. But the truth and the reality is uh, microsporidia, what, they, what probably happened was they had mitochondria with a mitochondrial genome, but they've eliminated that tiny little genome altogether. So they don't have DNA, but they still have this double membrane compartment. So for those of you that are students in the audience, this is still uh, a major mystery in the field. So uh, we need your help in trying to figure out what this proto-eukaryote is. It's an unsolved problem right now. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure that many of you have heard that you sort of inherit your mitochondria from your mom. Okay? So what exactly does that mean? I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth to it, but it's not completely true. It is true that you inherit your mitochondrial DNA from your mom. Okay? So um, the main chromosomes that I alluded to, you get half of those from mom and half of those from dad, then you end up producing 23 pairs of chromosomes. But the mitochondrial DNA, this is that tiny genome, about five copies for mitochondrion. This is only going to come from mom. And a very appropriate question is, why? Okay. And it's only over the last, again, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, I'm sort of digesting it in its relatively new results. But it's only over the last 10 years that we sort of fully appreciate why we get uh, this genome only from our mom. And there's basically three main reasons. Uh, the first is uh, shown in this cartoon. This is the unfertilized egg. This is the nucleus. This is going to contain 1.5 billion bases of DNA. And this is the uh, father, uh, the father's sperm. And uh, in here is going to be another 1.5 billion bases of DNA. So when those two merge, that's going to be 3 billion bases. That's the main genome. And what's shown in blue and what's shown in white are those tiny mitochondrial genomes. And it just so turns out that father has very few mtDNA molecules for the 500,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA that mom is going to provide. So that cell is the cell type that has the most copies of mitochondrial DNA in our entire body. Okay? So there's 500,000. Dad has at most 100 copies of the mitochondrial genome. So one of the reasons mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited is because of sheer dilution. And but it's more than that because these 100 copies uh, is an upper bound on the number of copies per sperm. And by the time it actually makes its long voyage, most of it has like degraded. There's all sorts of mutations and deletions in this tiny 16,000 base per sequence. Not only that, but covalently attached to this tiny little genome is a protein that's going to target the mitochondrial genome for degradation as soon as it hits mom. And so there's at least three reasons why uh, dad has a very low likelihood of transmitting his mitochondrial genome uh, to uh, uh, progeny. Uh, so this is an important lesson. And this is going to be important when we start talking about mitochondrial diseases because certain diseases that affect this organelle can be transmitted from either mom or dad, but other disorders can be transmitted only from mom. So this actually makes the genetics of mitochondrial disease very, very complex. And uh, another sort of neat feature of mitochondrial DNA is that it's been used as uh, a molecular clock. Uh, and so this tiny genome ends up mutating at a higher rate than the rest of our genome. Uh, and those of you that have been to some of the other Broad talks, you know that you can relate any two individual individuals' genomes to each other, count the number of differences between the two of them, and that provides you with a proxy for how related the two individuals are. And in this manner, you can actually reconstruct 
uh, human migration patterns. Um, and you can do that with a main DNA if you want to, but the mitochondrial DNA has some key advantages. First is uh, it has a high mutation rate. It doesn't undergo a process called recombination. Uh, and lastly, uh, it provides you with a, with a very accurate rendition of the maternal lineage. And so for these three reasons, it's been a very valuable tool for uh, biological anthropologists who have been able to sort of trace migration patterns across the world. Uh, and this is actually where the, uh, the out of Africa hypothesis was originally based uh, uh, using uh, 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 analysis of mtDNA. Um, so that actually concludes like the, the, the primer on mitochondria. That's actually the bulk of the talk. And now I wanted to sort of transition into uh, human diseases and just speak for a few minutes about some of the types of research projects that we have ongoing at the Broad aimed at targeting this organelle to try to improve uh, human disorders. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm trained clinically and when you're in the hospital, you always like to try to start uh, your didactics with a clinical case. And so I'm gonna uh, ask each of you to just read this case for the next uh, minute or so, and then we'll talk about it. I know there's at least one person in the audience that knows the answer to this particular um, uh, case, but um, let's, let's sort of go through it and try to figure out what's happening. Okay. So this is the case of a 35-year-old woman. She's presenting with a lot of perspiration. She is drinking a lot of water, but not peeing. She's thin, even though she's eating a lot of food and she's getting uh, uh, weaker. So she's had it since she was a child, so it's most likely inherited. And the only characteristic abnormal, abnormal finding is an increased basal metabolic rate. And then she has a couple of other findings, including a myopathy, muscle wasting and weakness. Uh, her reflexes are not so good uh, and uh, uh, she's spilling uh, some metabolites in her urine. Okay? But the primary finding is since this woman was a child, she's basically overheating. She's eating a lot of food, she's staying thin, and she is generating a lot of heat. And this is actually probably the first mitochondrial disease ever uh, described in detail. Uh, and many people now refer to this as Luft's syndrome. If you've never seen a patient like this, or None of your friends have ever had this particular constellation of symptoms. It's not too surprising. There's only been two cases like this ever reported. Um, and everyone wants to try to figure out what the molecular basis is because if you could figure out what the molecule is that's mutated so that you can eat all you want to and you stay thin, that could actually be very valuable. Uh, so Rolf Luft is a very, very famous uh, endocrinologist that's based at the Karolinska Institute. He was actually the endocrinologist that was asked to see this patient because when you have somebody presenting with this overheating syndrome, the first thing you're going to think is a high thyroid activity. So maybe the thyroid hormone is too high. But this is actually a case of euthyroid or normal thyroid hypermetabolism. And in a series of papers published in Nature and in the Journal of Clinical Investigation uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, what he did was uh, he teamed up with the leading mitochondrial biologist to take biopsies of muscle from this patient and purify that mitochondria and put it into a test tube and actually demonstrate uh, that what's happening is uh, her, her, her mitochondria are basically acting like brown fat mitochondria. So they're just taking all the fuels and just burning them up without producing energy equivalents. Um, and so it was a remarkable paper because it really combined very careful biochemical physiology with the clinical evaluation of a patient to make a diagnosis. Uh, and like I said, those of you that are interested in, in biomedicine, this is another open question. That is, uh, what is the molecular basis for uh, Luft's uh, disease? Um, that was the first sort of mitochondrial disease ever to be characterized. And now, 
uh, we have uh, a lot more sort of observations and knowledge since the 1950s, and we can broadly categorize mitochondrial diseases into two groups. Uh, there are something called the orphan genetic diseases. So these tend to be rare diseases, which are called orphan diseases, that have a genetic etiology, a genetic cause. Then the other broad category of human diseases are common complex disorders. And it's only over the last few years that we've come to appreciate that mitochondria can contribute to virtually all common diseases as well. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the components of mitochondria, uh, 13 of them come from the mitochondrial DNA, but a lot of other stuff, a subset of those 20,000 proteins from the nuclear genome also go to make up our mitochondria. And so as a consequence, when you have a patient that presents with an energetic defect, a clinical presentation suggestive of a, a disorder in the mitochondrion, then you have to ask uh, whether the defect might be coming from the mitochondrial genome or from the nuclear genome. And one type of clue you can rely on is when you have a patient that has you know, say a defect uh, 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 consistent with a mitochondrial disease, you can ask the patient, so what does your mother have? What did her mother look like? And if there's a disease that's segregating along the maternal branch, that's highly suggestive of something coming from here. And this is why a very detailed clinical history is important. This is why drawing out that clinical pedigree is really important. <clears throat> um, so one of the landmark events in mitochondrial medicine was the uh, sequencing in 1981 of that tiny mitochondrial genome. Uh, and this is almost exactly 20 years before rest of the human genome was sequenced. And so this is really the first genome to be sequenced. And this was in a different Cambridge, not, not Cambridge, Massachusetts. This was in Cambridge, UK. Uh, and once this genome was fully sequenced, physicians and researchers had a molecule that you could interrogate. So when a patient comes in with some of these symptoms and a family history suggestive of maternal transmission, Physicians and researchers were then able to go back and interrogate this tiny genome by resequencing it. And it's small enough so that you could do this on a relatively routine basis. And as a consequence, today there are greater than 50 mutations that are associated with maternally inherited mitochondrial diseases. Of course, 20 years later, the um, uh, rest of the genome was sequenced. Uh, and as a consequence, we've been able to implicate other components uh, of the mitochondrion in human diseases. And the list keeps on growing. Uh, and as of today, uh, there are over 60 nuclear genes. So these can be uh, passed down from mom or from dad in an autosomal recessive manner, in an autosomal dominant manner, in an X-linked manner uh, to give uh, rise to dysfunction of this organelle. And again, these are all sort of rare, disease, individually rare diseases, but collectively these mitochondrial disorders represent the largest class of uh, inborn errors of metabolism. So those are sort of the rare uh, diseases. Now, how about the common complex diseases? Well, what's, what's becoming quite clear over the last few years is that there are a number of uh, uh, common diseases, usually degenerative diseases, diseases associated with aging, uh, that are characterized by dysfunction of this organelle. Uh, so we showed a couple of years ago that in the common form of type 2 diabetes, the number and activity of mitochondria is reduced in skeletal muscle. Uh, there's uh, a wealth of data to suggest that there's mitochondrial dysfunction in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. Uh, there are certain tumors such as uterine fibroids uh, that are due to uh, uh, defects in this compartment. Um, deafness and blindness, uh, and a lot of drug toxicities, it looks like, are going to be due to adverse effects on the mitochondrion. And there's an entire um, uh, camp of researchers that believe that the, very, the aging process itself is basically um, uh, sort of a, a, a caused by mitochondrial dysfunction. So in those Rare orphan genetic diseases that I alluded to, essentially what's happening there is you're born typically with defective component machinery of that oil refinery. Okay? In these diseases, what appears to be the case, and again, this is still sort of early days for the genetics of complex diseases, but what's happening in the common disorders, it looks like, is you don't inherit a bad 
pipe or a bad screw in that factory. What's happening is you have a fine factory at birth, but some uh, power plants decline at a more rapid rate than others. And when they decline, they're not producing as much ATP as they could be. They're not producing it in as efficient a manner as possible. They're burning that oxygen and producing these reactive oxygen species at a greater rate than others. Okay? And so that, that's, that appears to be uh, the link between mitochondrial dysfunction and these degenerative diseases. And it's quite distinct from what's happening in those rare uh, orphan genetic diseases. So in the final um, five or 10 minutes or so, I just want to share with you some of the work that we're doing here at the Broad um, to try to fulfill the promise of genomics, if you will, for mitochondrial diseases. Um, and so this is very much a team-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, it involves me as well as a number of other scientists here uh, in this building. So <clears throat> what I told you earlier is that this genome that was sequenced in 1981 encodes 13 proteins that make up that beautiful structure that I showed you at the very beginning of this tour. Now, rest of that nuclear genome encodes a lot of proteins. And at this point, we don't have a good protein inventory. We don't even know what the parts list is for this factory. So, and not, not only that, but this oil refinery is going to vary from tissue to tissue. We know that our skeletal muscle is really good at burning fat. Our brain cannot burn fat. It can only burn glucose and some other fuel called ketone bodies. Okay? And so uh, our goal has been to try to figure out what the protein inventory is for the mitochondrion across a battery of tissues. And we're using a technology called proteomics. And some of you may have heard of genomics and sort of the next thing after genomics is proteomics. And proteomics refers to the systematic analysis of proteins in cells. And here's a typical proteomics experiment. What we do is we isolate mitochondria from a tissue in the same way that Rolf Luft had isolated mitochondria from that patient. Once we've purified them, we can solubilize the proteins, and then we put it into a, a really fancy machine called a mass spectrometer. And what the mass spectrometer does is it's essentially going to figure out the mass of each protein in uh, this particular mixture. And it's very, 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 very good at figuring out the mass of any given protein. Uh, so good that you can distinguish which protein from the human genome must have been in your mixture. And so we collect lots and lots of mass spectra. We get a mass for each protein. We can put all of that information into a computer, map it against the human genome, which is sequenced, we essentially get a list of all of the proteins that must have been in that initial mixture. Of course, we don't want to do this only for one tissue. So what we've been doing is we've been obtaining mitochondria from about 14 different tissues. And we subject each of these to a proteomic analysis, trying to build up an atlas, if you will, of what actually makes up our um, organelle. And we think this is going to be important because right now, when a patient presents to the clinic with features consistent with a mitochondrial disorder, we can interrogate that tiny little mitochondrial genome by resequencing it. But if we had a list of the other 1,000 genes that make up this compartment, you could imagine that we just have to resequence those 1,000 genes, which is actually becoming quite uh, tenable in the next few years. Um, so those are some of our efforts to try to figure out what the inventory is. We're also very interested in trying to come up with biomarkers, if you will, for mitochondrial function. So wouldn't it be nice if we could actually just have a blood test and we could actually figure out if somebody's mitochondria are functioning well or not? And I think I have one other video, Megan, if, uh, where is, if you don't mind. I just want to, in just a few minutes, I'm going to have one other video. So right now, when you have a patient that presents to the clinic, what you have to do typically is you have to obtain a biopsy material. So what these are are uh, skeletal muscle biopsies. And what you do is you stain them. You add colorimetric substrates. And if they change color, it means that the mitochondria are functioning properly. And if not, they're not working properly. So in this particular case, these three uh, parts of the cell are not functioning properly. That's why they're white, whereas the rest of it is working properly. And this gives rise to a really pretty picture called the ragged red fiber, which is sort of pathognomonic, if you will, for a mitochondrial disease. Now, this is great, except it's neither sensitive nor specific for detecting mitochondrial disease. It's also invasive. It requires a muscle biopsy. So we want to try to improve on it. Um, and 
Various groups have come up with very elaborate criteria for trying to figure out if somebody has a mitochondrial disease. And this is the diagnostic algorithm that you're supposed to use if you're a physician during your 15 minute visit to try to figure out if the patient that you're seeing has a mitochondrial disorder. And it's, it's broken up into major diagnostic criteria. There are minor diagnostic criteria. And after you've gone through this entire menu, which is really complex, at the very end, if you have one major criterion and one minor criterion or three minor criteria, you might have a mitochondrial disorder. Okay. So th this is tough. And we feel like we need to improve on this. The year is 2007, so we ought to be able to do better. So if we can get the lights. So we draw inspiration from Star Wars. <laughs> Obi-Wan. Yes, Master. I need an analysis of this blood sample I'm sending you. Wait a minute. I need a metachlorine count. The reading's off the chart. Over 20,000. Even Master Yoda doesn't have a metachlorine count that high. No, Jedi has. What does that mean? I'm not sure. So in the field of medicine, that's what you call in-field diagnostics. And that's what we're all striving for, okay? And we're not, we're not quite there at this point, but this is where we are right now, okay? You know that little wand that they had? This is our wand right over here. It weighs about half a ton or so. It's called a tandem mass spectrometer. And we have three machines called uh, HPLC. So we put that tiny little drop of blood into the HPLC. It goes into this half ton machine and we get a lot of spectra. And what this is capable of doing is measuring lots and lots of metabolites circulating chemicals in the blood. And what we're trying to do now is we work with our collaborators at the Mass General Hospital. We have patients that have bona fide mitochondrial diseases. We draw blood from them. We also draw blood from matched controls. We run it through the tandem mass spectrometer. And we're trying to figure out chemicals in the blood that help distinguish healthy from disease. So those of you that have been to your doctor recently, they might order something called a Chem 7 or a Chem 20. This is like a Chem 220, so we can monitor 220 metabolites in a 10 minute run. So we're not quite at Star Wars, um, uh, you know, we're not quite uh, there yet, but we're hoping that we might be able to develop a very simple blood test that could assist us in our diagnosis. And uh, finally, it's great if we can find the genes uh, that underlie these disorders. It's great if we can make the diagnosis. But in the end, what we want are curative therapies. And right now, there are no curative therapies for any mitochondrial disease. So this is a great unmet need. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's sort of broad classes. These are the genetic disorders, uh, the, the orphan genetic disorders, and the common diseases. Uh, and the mtDNA diseases tend to be more slowly progressive. The nuclear genetic diseases tend to be very severe. They affect kids. Uh, and the common diseases are these age-associated degenerative disorders. So we're actually going after two of these classes of disorders uh, through our chemical screening efforts. And essentially what we do is we grow some of these cells, some of the relevant cells, such as muscle cells, uh, in the laboratory. So we can grow muscle, differentiate them into myotubes. They can contract with electrical stimuli. We grow them in these plates called 384 well plates. So we can we have 384 different compartments in which we grow the cells. We can model, we can use genetic strategies to model the disease in each um, well. And then what we do is we come in with an entire library of chemical compounds uh, and we have a readout of what the mitochondrial function is. And what we're essentially doing is we're checking to see if any of the compounds, if any of the chemicals that we sprinkle into one of these wells will boost mitochondrial function. And so we've been doing that recently using some of the FDA approved drugs with the hope that some of the already approved drugs might be useful for the mitochondrial diseases as well. Um, so that's the uh, getting close to the end of the tour of mitochondria. I've spoken to you a little bit about just some of the fascinating aspects of this organelle. 
and then I shared with you sort of its role in both the rare orphan genetic diseases as well as the common diseases. Uh, and lastly, I just told you a little bit about some of the work that's ongoing here uh, at the Broad. Uh, and uh, with that, I will uh, take questions. or something from the nucleus go into or so you didn't what is the verb there what, what, what goes into the mitochondria and adds the effect of the, the genome in the mitochondria what, what, what goes in there proteins or right or so right so I'm actually going to back up to slide so here's that cartoon of a cell again and so that's the nucleus, and that's where the DNA is. And inside of the nucleus, the DNA is going to get converted into something called RNA. And it's going to escape from here to here. That's the message. And here, in the cytosol, the RNA gets converted into protein. That's a process called translation. And so those thousand genes that we're interested in are here as a part of this genome. They're going to be transcribed, and the RNA is going to come out here. And those are going to get translated into protein in uh, the cytosol. And once the protein is there, it has to get imported into the mitochondrion. Does that make sense? And so, so uh, it's a complex structure. 13 of those proteins are actually coming from within. The, the DNA is there, the RNA is there, the proteins are made there. But everything else has to be brought in through this very elaborate protein import machinery. Does every mitochondria within a cell have exactly the same gene sequence, or are there any variations in them? Yeah, great, great question. And so um, remember that unfertilized egg has about half a million copies of mitochondrial DNA, right? And each of our other body cells has 1,000, 2,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA. And the question is, are all those uh, sequences identical? We believe that under normal healthy conditions, they're largely identical. But there are certain diseases, the maternally inherited diseases, where you can get a mutation or a misspelling in the mitochondrial DNA. And you can actually have a scenario where in one cell, you have something called heteroplasmy. And heteroplasmy refers to a mixture of both wild type or a healthy sequence as well as mutant. And so some patients uh, uh, will be completely fine until that ratio gets really high. So you typically have about 2,000 copies of mtDNA per cell. And in certain tissues, if the amount of mutant to wild type exceeds a ratio of about 60 if 60% or so mutant, then the disease will actually start manifesting. And so that can actually happen. It actually makes the diagnosis even more challenging. Um, and so related to that is when you actually have that uh, unfertilized egg with 500,000 copies, half of which are wild type and half of which are mutant, after it's fertilized, it's actually going to start dividing. And we believe that the mitochondrial DNA gets segregated in a stochastic manner. So it's actually quite possible that certain tissues will have a very high mutant load, whereas other tissues have a very uh, high load of wild type molecules. And this is probably another factor that contributes to the uh, complex presentation of mitochondrial disorders. Because some patients with the exact same mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, they'll only have their brain affected. Others will have their muscle affected. And it's probably because this mtDNA is segregated in a manner such that the affected tissues have inherited more of the mutant molecules. You're affiliated with both Mass General Hospital and the Broad Institute. As you do your research, what is the relationship between the two organizations? Right, so uh, great question. Uh, so the Broad Institute is a research institute uh, that, form, that represents a collaboration of Harvard Medical School, uh, of Harvard University, uh, MIT, and all of the Harvard-affiliated hospitals. Uh, and uh, there are a fair number of researchers 
uh, that have academic appointments at one of these institutions that spend a part of their time at the Broad as well. So this is basically uh, a home for pursuing projects that you can't pursue in your own laboratory. And so I spend a part of two days a week here at the Broad, three days a week over at the Mass General, and we tend to pursue projects here that we could never pursue in our own laboratory. And uh, it ends up being a very, very collaborative environment where uh, you can uh, form uh, uh, collaborations with others that have expertise in uh, special, special uh, technologies or areas of science. I don't know if I answer, I don't know if you're asking about the fiscal relationship or IP relationship or. The common diseases that you mentioned, is there a relationship among them? Is there a theme that's relating to the mitochondria? Yeah, so that's a great, great question. That's actually something that we're actively working on. We're actually trying to figure out whether there's some common mode of pathogenesis, if you will, that links all these common degenerative diseases to the mitochondria. And I tried um, referring to our current theory with that cartoon, uh, not cartoon, but with the pictures of the uh, chemical factories from my hometown. It doesn't look like any of those common degenerative diseases are due to outright mutations in the component machinery of the mitochondrion. But rather, it looks like as we age, there is a dysfunction of the mitochondrion. And this is particularly the case for type 2 diabetes, which I'm most familiar with. There have been a recent set of uh, genome-wide association studies trying to figure out what the root genetic basis of type 2 diabetes is. And the genes that have emerged so far none of them appear to be encoding proteins in the mitochondrion. However, if you take, if you examine the muscle or the liver of diabetics and healthy controls, they're almost always associated with fewer number of mitochondria in the muscle, and they're not as efficient. They're not producing ATP uh, in as efficient a manner as possible. And so, it, it doesn't look like there's an inherited defect in one of the components of the mitochondrion, but what does appear to be inherited is the predilection towards uh, a dysfunctional mitochondrion. So I don't know if that makes sense, but. Is that related to Alzheimer's? Is that function related also to Alzheimer's? Is there a connection between diabetes yeah. and Alzheimer's? Yeah, so, uh, I, so uh, I think there is. I think there is. And in fact, um, there are a couple of mouse models for various uh, disorders such as Huntington's disease. And, you know, in Huntington's disease, the primary manifestation is neurological. But if you should go back and carefully phenotype them with respect to glucose metabolism, a greater than average number of Huntington's patients actually have defects of glucose homeostasis as well. So to some extent, I think there's an ascertainment bias in clinical medicine where, you know, if somebody comes in with seizures, you're going to focus on their seizures and the neurological symptoms, but they might have a lot of other symptoms that are not as uh, devastating. Uh, and in fact, the, the rare genetic diseases, the rare mitochondrial disorders, those were initially called encephalomyopathies because the neurologists were seeing the patients because they had symptoms in their muscle and in their brains. But it's quite clear now that you know, dysfunction in this organelle affects the eyes, the ears, the pancreas, a, a number of other organs as well. So was your ability to, um, was your ability to um, use this non-invasive blood sample a consequence of having the uh, protein atlas from mitochondria? Right, so uh, we're talking about two things. Uh, we are building this protein atlas of the mitochondrion. And that's going to help us figure out what the genes are that are mutated in some of these disorders. Uh, but we're also trying to come up with a blood test for mitochondrial dysfunction. And in that case, when we analyze the blood, we're actually not analyzing the proteins. We're actually analyzing the small molecules, things like glucose. The, I don't know if you've seen one of those metabolic charts um, uh, uh, that are often hung on walls of uh, laboratories, but those are small molecules, the glycolytic intermediates, the TCA cycle intermediates, the pentose phosphate met, uh, metabolites. So these are non-protein molecules that are circulating in the blood, and those are the ones that we're interrogating uh, for diagnostics. So I noticed that um, there were 37 mitochondrial genes, but only 13 proteins. What's uh, what are the functions of the other genes? Right. That's actually related to uh, one of the earlier questions. So. There's 37 genes, 13 of them are making proteins, but remember within the mitochondrion, you need to do your transcription and you need to do your translation so that those 13 genes can go to RNA, can go to protein. 
So that process of transcription and then translation requires other genes that are not coding proteins but are coding tRNAs or rRNAs. And so those are called non-coding RNAs or transfer RNAs for the tRNAs. Those are encoded within the mitochondrial genome, within the mitochondrial genome for use within the mitochondrion. So they're required for the proper transcription and translation of those 13 proteins. I'm sorry, can you, can you speak up like that? You mentioned the possibility of uh, a drug-related cure of mitochondrial diseases. How would it be possible to create a drug that targets like the, the damage or the malfunction of mitochondrial when they're not even the same within the, certain, the same cells sometimes? Right, so, um, uh, so, so we're, we're always looking for creative strategies um, for trying to eliminate dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, and so, one of the strategies, so I'll give you an example and maybe that'll help uh, sort of answer your question. So, so the question is, if you have a lot of mitochondria within a cell, and the goal is to come up with a drug that's gonna somehow eliminate the unhealthy ones but preserve the good ones, how do you do that? And it's a great, great question. So there are a couple of different strategies. One strategy is um, if a particular cell has a very high number of mutant mitochondria, maybe that cell should just eliminate itself. So that's what's called program cell death. And so one strategy is to somehow detect which cells are harboring a lot of dysfunctional mitochondria and have those cells commit suicide. Okay? So that's one possible strategy. There's another strategy called heteroplasmic shifting. Okay? And so a question was asked earlier, is it possible to have both wild type and mutant mtDNAs within a given cell? Well, whenever you have a disproportionately large number of mutant mtDNAs, those cells are now gonna start relying on other fuel sources. Right? They can't support oxidative metabolism. They're gonna be more reliant on glycolytic metabolism. So if you have a drug that is gonna selectively hit glycolytic cells, the cells that harbor a very large percentage of mutant mtDNAs might be more sensitive and thereby die. And so there's a number of strategies that you could imagine would work. Again, this is all in theory that I'm telling you. And we're actually trying to uh, uh, use some of these strategies to actually cure the diseases. But if you have other strategies, we'd love to hear them because it's, it's not easy. Yeah, I'd like to thank you very much for speaking tonight. I'd like to thank you all for coming and please join us for the reception in the lobby.